Hey, hey everybody, it's Sleepy Reader, AKA Damien, and today, as you probably know from the title of this, I'm gonna give you a little overview of this newly released Tashin Little Nemo book. So um, I, figure, I think I figured out how I can use my new webcam to point down at it and it can just barely uh, contain the book. So um, I haven't read a lot of it, I've just been thumbing through it and I had a request that's from somebody uh, this past weekend that I do a little video on it. So uh, let's take a look at the book together. Um, let's see, I go like that, the camera, there we go. So uh, I'm still fiddling with this camera a bit. Uh, it has this desk view uh, option. But you can see it's it's angled past my desk to a certain degree, but it seems to be able to take in this book. So that that's pretty cool. <clears throat> and what size is this book? Let me see if I can grab a regular size comic book. There's the size comparison. So it's not as huge as some of the really huge books we get these days, but it's pretty big. And Tashin had apparently two much larger versions of Little Nemo, like two, a two volume Little Nemo. And this seems to be the same material, but all scrunched down into this one book. And maybe it's a little more readable. It's still a very heavy, bulky book, but a little easier to, uh, to manage and put on a table and read. <clears throat> the downside is it's not at the original size these were printed in, in the old newspapers, you know, over a hundred years ago. This is uh, covers from 1905 to 1927, claims to be the complete Little Nemo. Uh, I believe it was just a Sunday, a Sunday feature in the newspapers. And this part is cool. I would like books that had a lot more blown up panels. I, I'm just a big fan of that for, you know, when you love the artist. Uh, but I love these opening pages like that. Um, so it not only wants to uh, present to you every page, every Sunday page of Little Nemo, but it also has a huge section that is, um, I guess, background material, analysis, uh, influences even, um, uh, that Little Nemo did. That's uh, by itself, I think, well, there's no page numbering, wait. Where is there? There's 141. Yeah, so it's about 140 pages or more of text. There's the end notes. So yeah, about 140, what's this, 145. So 145 pages before you get to the actual strips. So that that's pretty amazing. And it's really more than a book's worth because look how tiny the print is. But this print is so tiny that, um, I don't know, it's quite an effort to read. <laughs> and uh, when print is this tiny and in these long columns, I think that also adds to the difficulty. And I think what they're trying to do here is replicate the experience of reading as if these are articles in an old time newspaper. And I think this was originally designed for those even larger volumes. So I'm assuming half of this stuff, half of this material appeared in one of the large volumes and half in the other. Um, I, know, I, I have, have read little, a little bit of this stuff the other day, um, but mostly what I've learned is um, that Mc, Windsor McKay did a bunch of other kind of dream comics before Little Nemo. One of them was called uh, The Rare Bit Fiend um, but there's also Little Sammy Sneeze. And the difference with Little Nemo was um, focusing on a child and having a single character. Whereas I guess the dream of the rabbit fiend was a different person's dream. I get, I, they said in the text, I didn't realize that before in every, um, in every episode. And I also was reading about how he was influenced by circuses and fairs and carnivals of the time in the way he did um, his comics, especially the Little Nemo comics. And he was very into architecture. So I, 
uh, this is not very, I can't be very informative yet on that, but you get the idea that there's a lot of material here to read if you want to go into the background. Um, the way it's ordered is a little confusing to me, like I can't quickly find what I want to know about uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland or, or about Windsor McKay, the artist. Um, <clears throat> I think this was maybe part of what I started reading about fairs and uh, carnivals and the like. So the, um, the context of this at the time may have seemed a little more familiar than it does to us now when we look at it visually. So let's, uh, let's skip across to, I feel like the, uh, the paper is very nice. And even though it still has a bit of a grainy look, you know, because it was reproduced from a newspaper, I feel like they've done a very good job at, um, is this focused very much? I, don't, I wonder how I get this new camera of mine to be more like will it focus where my finger is or something I guess not but anyway I love the detail and the uh, crispness of the printing is really nice and it's um I don't know uh, maybe it would be better on newsprint or newsprint like paper it is a slicker paper but it feels like it does a good they did a good job with the color of keeping it toned down to a certain degree not too bright um And what strikes you when you just quickly look at Little Nemo is the incredible sense of design and visual inventiveness, the playing with the page um, and the playing with the shapes of things in the page, in the, in the panels, um, the uh, repetition of shapes it seems very thought out. It, it feels like Little Nemo, done over 100 years ago, was the whole package visually. Um, something that you don't see much in other um, comic book artists. So we have a lot of c catching up to do with the past in a way sometimes. Um, so, and, and what it, it has a repeating motif, of course, of Little Nemo goes into dreamland and in the last panel he wakes up. Um, uh, and the parents always come in and are upset with Nemo or they're off stage and tell Nemo to go back to sleep. Um, yes, ma'am, I'm getting up. You better, if you want to go to church with us, come hurry, Nemo. Um, anyway, uh, but I, one thing I realized is they were, um, there was kind of a con continuing adventure where Nemo is searching for the princess in dreamland slumberland or wherever it is that he is oops um and to that end i did already have a little nemo book a very slender one but actually just about the same proportions called little nemo in the palace of ice and further adventures and it's from dover publications I bought it fairly recently, but it's copyright 1976. I assume, obviously, uh, Little Nemo is out of print, but um, I think this this might be a better size to get a bunch of Little Nemos. If you could get all the Little Nemo, but in a bunch of separate volumes, that might actually be a nice thing. I, I read this whole book a while ago with his ventures in the Palace of Ice, and it <clears throat> it didn't stick with me. Um, so I'm wondering if, like when I look visually, other, other sections actually look more appealing to me than the uh, Palace of Ice, but they must have thought it, it created a more um, unified narrative maybe than some other parts of Little Nemo. But maybe there's a whole series of, of Dover books out there. Um, yeah, uh, it's still full of a lot of cool stuff, of course. And another thing that strikes me as I look through it, it's, it's fun to look through, but then you get kind of overwhelmed by so much creativity by looking at, um, what is it, 10 or 15 years of his creative work. Uh, yeah, about 15 or 17 years of his creative work. 
So, um, so I'm going to have to pace myself to really read this and, and try not to keep, it's, it's so tempting to just keep flipping and flipping as I'm doing now. Um, So I'm not sure what else to say. It feels almost like you're getting a peek into a private universe. <laughs> and it does feel like a whole universe of, uh, of inside the brain of Windsor McKay. Everything about this book, it's, it's got nice binding. You know, I'm very picky about that. Um, and uh, the covers feel very nice. And like I said, the paper is really nice. Um, I think my biggest complaint is, is, is those, the print, this tiny print there. That's, that's the thing that bugs me. And of course, we have a lot of um, what we would now consider racist images of the, I presume, I don't know if that's supposed to be a person in blackface. I presume it's supposed to be a representative of an African, um, an actual African. Uh, but what they, uh, I wonder if there's something in the introduction here to talk about what they, just honestly talk about what the white people of the United States at the time made of a figure like this, um, what, what he represented to them. And there's another figure who looks like he's kind of in blackface too, and I used to know his name, Flip maybe, but he's always got, his face is always green. And I thought, when I saw it elsewhere, I thought for modern versions they had, like when other people did Little Nemo, that they had uh, greenwashed his face but now I see here you know a, a brown figure and a green figure so so that must not be the case they they seem to be kind of just from glancing through and my memory of reading about flip in some other versions kind of impish uh odd odd impish characters um of course, everyone is, is odd, of course, in these uh, stories, except for Little Nemo. I wonder, maybe they do this here, I'd love to hear reviews of Little Nemo in his day. Like what did, if anyone wrote anything critical about, about comic strips back in you know the 1920s or the 1910s, uh, what they would say about Little Nemo, how they would characterize it. Seems to be getting a bit tamer towards the end here. Not that it's very tame, but. <laughs> Look at all these giant babies. So that's my look at Little Nemo. Um, who knows, maybe when I've read a lot of Little Nemo, I'll come back with some thoughts about it, or maybe not. Maybe it'll just take too much time to actually get through this. And I may, I don't know how frequently I'll be dipping into this. But I hope everyone is having a good comic book week and I'll be back soon with a different video.